wild card. I've been um, I've been enjoying sporting art over the last few weeks, um, specifically the last two weeks, because we've had the Melbourne Storm in the finals once again. They demolished the Manly Seagulls last week, and as I alluded to in the intro. I have been watching and absorbing some All Blacks footy, mainly just because it's on like a Sunday evening, perfect time, 6, 7 p.m. Um, Australia sucks at rugby. Argentina's up and down. Shout out to all the um, Latino rugby folk out there. But it's been just basically an uh, All Blacks uh, show every Sunday evening, which Sunday evenings for me are pretty pretty prime time, like country calendar, and just like there's generally some rugby league there's generally some sports happening and then of course you've got country calendar lurking in the background so sunday evenings are absolute prime time for me and i've been enjoying the all blacks show and i'm just intrigued to see how you interpret the melbourne storm and all blacks because i've kind of updated i've got i've taken myself from a spin bowler with you know 20 revolutions per minute on my leg spins to fucking a billion to take that SEMA reference earlier further. You've added have, an arm ball or something. Yeah, I've added an, there you go. I've added an arm ball. I've added a douche to my repertoire because I've gone from comparing the All Blacks and the Melbourne Storm culturally. This is something we have discussed a few times. We are um, lovers of sports team culture here and keen observers of team culture. And I, last year after the Storm won their premiership, I did, write about the actual connections like you actually have personnel who have crossover between the all blacks yep. and the melbourne storm whether it be like top of my head um andrew blowers former auckland all black he has a role with the melbourne storm i believe still where it's like a he's like a cultural advisor a well-being officer with the melbourne storm so there's one connection uh wayne smith has done stuff with the all Bla- uh, with the melbourne storm before there's a guy who was like an owner or a part of the Melbourne Storm board who was also part of the New Zealand Rugby Board and a, internet, a world rugby board as well. So there is actual genuine crossover, let alone the Melbourne Storm have had like Richie McCaw in to speak to the Melbourne Storm as well. So there's actual um, personnel that have crossover between the All Blacks and the Melbourne Storm. And that has led into, I believe, our cultural crossover where you've got some of the same ethos like just do your job uh, we clean the changing rooms you know being present you know my, melbourne storm have dealt with all the COVID stuff the best because they just like we're lucky to be here where you know this is what we're doing right now it's not about being down in the dumps with anything you just roll forward you adapt that like without going too deep into it these are basically the same organizations culturally and that's why they are so successful but the doosra that I have developed is how entertaining they are. And I like, I, I named the email. I named the, um, I gave the, uh, the all blacks in one of the emails, the honor of being the greatest show in rugby. And I think that's literally what they are because you watch the all blacks and you are getting entertainment personified. You're getting chip kicks. You're getting grubbers in behind the lines. You're getting offloads. You're getting um, all sorts of razzle-dazzle, which the All Blacks, like I don't think for keen rugby fans around the world, they'll tune and watch the All Blacks for this reason. So it's not news to them. But I'm like the same things happen with the Melbourne Storm. Over the last few years, the Melbourne Storm have become a very attacking team. Solid defense. Both teams are solid defensively, but it's their entertainment which has um, been at the front of my mind and like they are mandatory viewing if you like rugby or rugby league because you're going to get new skills on offer you're going to get new game plans on offer you're going to get um the players who are confident and capable of expressing themselves to the absolute fullest and it's i've taken like you watch the melbourne storm and the all blacks and you have fun and i think that's like a i think it's like because you think about these teams and you think like um if you have such a team culture you don't really have characters. You don't have the larrikins. You don't have guys having fun. You have like a strict culture where it's like, now nah, we need to knuckle down and do this. But you look at um, Melbourne Storm, you got Munster, you got Cameron Smith. You got all these characters who are empowered to be themselves. That's all Blacks culture as well. You've got like um, cultures coming together, 
like people coming together everyone can be themselves and in new zealand we get a bit caught up in like uh ian foster all blacks coach is he gonna be you know what's he doing like rah, rah, rah. i see a team that is just as entertaining as it was under shag henson so i'm just curious like how do you do you have any thoughts about like how those teams are just uh as an entertainment product like i'd go as far as they play their respective sports like a harlem globetrotters would like you're not expecting Bowden barrett to get the ball early in the first half and put a grubber in behind the defensive line from his own half but like you're not expecting that. But that's razzle dazzle, and that's what they do. Melbourne Storm, they'll put forty points on you in the first half. That's what they do, and they do so shifting the footy. And it's like I think that's the the extra layer of comparison for these two teams is just how entertaining they are, and how they have added razzle dazzle Harlem Globetrotter aspects of their sport to their game without taking away from their defense without taking away from their team culture or who they are and what they stand for. Yeah. And you'd, you'd have to say that hasn't always been the case for either of them, like, especially mm. the storm who were once known as a, like a, one of the great, like grinded out kind of teams. Um, and I suppose that's a, that's a sign of um, an organ, like another sign of an organization that's doing it. Well, I wouldn't say everything right, but you know, the majority of things, right. I can pick a few things from the storm history and the all blacks history, both where things were definitely not done right. But um, when you maintain your, like just speaking on the field, when you maintain your high end level of results through different incarnations of the team like that, that's always a pretty amazing sign. Um, like the all blacks continue winning as they have rolled through like, post Richie McCaw, Dan Carter, Conrad Smith days kind of thing. Like, um, and the, the storm have continued winning after Slater, Cronk and Smith have, have all um, retired and moved on and um, styles have changed and they've adapted and stayed ahead of things. I, I have felt at times, particularly late in the Hanson days, I think maybe there's some of that stuff was, um, innovation for the sake of innovation like the moanga barrett um dual playmaker thing never never really clicked and it kind of did feel like their last world cup like they were leaving themselves a bit undercooked or maybe a bit over i don't know um don't want to use the the word arrogant that normally gets thrown at them by northern hemisphere commentators but um may, maybe like a little complacent in, in some ways and that has been like their fair criticisms about um about ian foster it seems uh, there are also, I think, a very fair um, uh, you, you know, slice of praise to be said to him that he has seemingly like continued on that without it feeling like it's um, you know, uh, razzle-dazzle for the sake of razzle-dazzle, like there's been a bit of substance to it. Um, maybe, there's a, maybe there's a point to make as well about the way that the Storm and the All Blacks uh, res like cycle through wingers. <laughs> maybe there's something there as well, I don't know, but... Um, Shit. Other than that, I think you, you've summed it up. I, I don't know what else there is to add other than to say that what we're talking about here is just like two sporting teams um, who win a lot of games, have won a lot of games for a long time and operate at a high level. And like, this is what that looks like, basically. Yeah, I think like in summary of that like, point specifically, it's like we, I think the easy way to view these teams, as you said, is like very... I don't know if we think of them as fun, entertaining teams. But over the mm, last few yeah. weeks, that has been hammered home, that these are the most entertaining teams in either competition. International yeah, The first thing you think of for either of them is dominant results, isn't it? Yeah, and then but what comes after that? Yeah. Like, what comes yeah, exactly. after that for you? Like, the, the after... After that is the is the um enjoyment factor that you're talking no, about. So it's... like like stereotypically, you think like dominant results, and you're like, whoa, defense and fucking they can't have fun because team oh, right. culture okay, and all okay. that. On a wider scale, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, I think like they they are dominant without losing anything that they are like core fundamental who they are. They don't lose any of that, but right now they are also the most entertaining thing in their sports. Like Storm, just 
you watch their game, you're going to have fun. You're going to, if you're a rugby league fan, you're going to have fun watching them and everything they do, how they go about all their little plays and their skills and all that. And if you're international rugby, like teams right now, again, coming from New Zealand, bit arrogant, but like teams aren't playing rugby union the same way the All Blacks do. Like they just, mainly because they can't, like they don't have the, the players to, but also the confidence and just the comfort to be able to get out and express yourself and have fun, um, which I think is like a new wrinkle to both teams that people kind of overlook. And it's that development is it's fun for me because like I've watched the storm for a long time. We have respected the storm for a long time and they are as entertaining as ever. So that's fun to watch all blacks. You're like, okay, we know everything about the all blacks. We're from New Zealand. We watch the all blacks and we know everything that comes with the all blacks. But right now they're as fun to watch as they've ever been. So it's like that adds a whole new wrinkle of um enjoying those sports which brings us to nrl finals footy and the team that got absolutely smoked by the storm last weekend was the manly sea eagles and they come against up against the roosters in my preview on the niche-case.com i am hoping for a bounce back here from the sea eagles and specifically Morgan Harper, um, the Storm, again, going back to one of the key elements of sport and sport coaching. I've heard this referred to like Bill Belichick type of stuff. Craig Bellamy does it really well. You um, take away, you limit the best player, you limit their strength, and you attack their weakness. And that, that was quintessential Melbourne Storm last weekend. Unfortunately, it came at the expense of Morgan Harper defending at right center, although I believe just watching some of the footage and they all had similar missed tackle counts. I think it was a um, attacking that edge as opposed to attacking Morgan Harper because some of the players were attacking Cherry Evans. Cherry Evans and Hamole Olakuatu and Harper all had you know, multiple missed tackles. So I think it was more of a... Um, attacking that side of the field as a, as opposed to attacking Morgan Harper but um, and also Harper Harper gets highlighted because he dropped that ball for the um, errors, for the first yeah. try which he is why yeah um so yeah Harper from Narawahia I think he will be a lot better this week and you'd, you'd expect the whole yep. Seagulls team to be a lot better just under Des Hasler are you along the same line like um Harper wasn't really like he did have three years, so he, that's a below par performance from Harper. He was down on his usual antics, but in predicting the whole Sea Eagles bounce back, I think you're going to see Harper get back to his regular mahi um, at right center, and I think you're just going to see like all the numbers, all the stats, all the performance from the Sea Eagles would be better. You'll get more Karen foreign involvements. Josh Alawai and Marty Tapao will be a lot more impactful through the middle. Um, and the reason, Wildcard, as I chuck it over to you, that I'm sticking with the Seagulls and talking a lot about the Seagulls is I think they'll win, but also the Roosters' Kiwi NRL numbers are dwindling week by week. Joey Manu was ruled out um, a few weeks ago with the Latrell Mitchell stuff. Sio Siwa Tokiaho, um, Otara Scorpions Jr., he is out injured and he won't play in this game. So now we've just got Wadao Hargraves. We've got Isaac Liu, who has played every game this season, and Satili Tupanuia as well. So Roosters' numbers are decreasing. All their players are in the forwards. Manly Seagulls just have a bit more Kiwi NRL funk and uh, I think will be the more interesting Kiwi NRL team. Yeah, the Roosters have just had injuries and stuff across the board all season. They've just had a rotten year in that in that um, in that case, and I that's got to catch up with you eventually. It's, I um, yeah, I, I tend to agree. I think the Seagulls will be a team that bounce back. I think the the scope for them to bounce back does involve a lot of Morgan Harper being a lot better, and like he wasn't. Yeah, it, it, clearly it was a bad game, but the idea that he was like the liability or the weak link sort of thing, I think that is exacerbated just by like, because um, that that 
the drop pass that I mentioned, that was as much a bad Cherry Evans pass as it was. Like, he still should have caught it, but it wasn't exactly in the bread basket sort of thing. Like, it's an error on both ends, but it goes down to the the person who drops it. And then when the Storm picked the ball up, screwed away and scored, I think it was the, I think it was the first try. And then that leads to, like, a pretty healthy victory. Um, the narrative is set very early on that the right edge has been um, targeted and that Harper is the weak link because he made that error sort of thing. And he went on to make more errors. He missed a couple of tackles. And, you know, it's not... It wasn't a good performance by him, but I think also like the fact whenever it becomes about like the narrative is this, I think that's also always worth um, taking a step back from and seeing like, well, why? And um, is it because of something like uh, a tangible weakness that can't be improved or is it just one of those things? So sort of, I suspect that was maybe one of those things. And at the very least, like, um, the roosters in their current shape will not be able to do what the, um, what the storm do, you know, the, the, it's going to be a different, t- even if, even if all that is true, like he's still going to be in with an easier task against the roosters than he was against, um, against the storm. And like, what it was the roosters who, um, the roosters who just scraped by against the Titans, wasn't it? And, you know, late drop goal. And, um, the Titans looked awful early on in that game and have looked pretty ever i was sitting there watching it being like how did this team get into the um how did this team make the aid and then like, oh that's right they won 44 nil last week <laughs> beat the warriors <laughs> knocked them out um but i mean that was a warriors team that had given up and you knew they gave up because they they very clearly expressed that they had given up a couple of their players uh during the second half there like um the fact that the Roosters were as unconvincing as they were and needed needed like Sam Walker to come off the bench and pop another droppy for them, um, that also suggests... And the fact that they dropped a fifth in the first place as well was already signs of this. Like the, the, the injuries are catching up and it's very, 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 very difficult even for the best teams um, to be able to sustain changes to your, to your preferred 17 every week pretty much. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I tend to agree. I think the Sea Eagles have a have a lot of scope for improvement, and I think we'll see that. And I suspect that um, the gap between them and the Storm was it, it maybe isn't quite as big as it appeared um, in this game. And that uh, I do I do hope they meet again because if they do meet again, it'll be in the it'll be in the grand final because of the way the um, draw works. But if they do get another opportunity to see the ways in which those matchups that were targeted um, by the Storm how that how that goes at the second attempt like when you sort of know now how they want to get at you um but but you know we we might see that we might not they'd have to get through like uh is it like who, who's on the other side of the draw penrith and south sydney i think um we'll see Penrith's. how that goes but yeah um which i it could it could happen i do think this i i would be tipping the seagulls for this game the other thing with the Morgan Harper Manly right edge is that they're coming up against Adam Kieran and Drew Hutchison. Yeah. So that is very different. Like, shout out to Angus Crichton. Angus Crichton's like fantastic edge forward, but Adam Kieran is not um, Justin Ollum. <laughs> Fuck it. Definitely not Justin Ollum. And Drew Hutchison is not Cameron Munster. Um, Kieran missed six tackles last week Hutchison missed five and Angus Crichton missed seven so that's gonna like not only are they not going to have the same attacking impetus that Melbourne Storm had but also probably less defensively efficient as the Melbourne Storm on that side of the field as well so I think that's aligning for a Morgan Harper bounce back and Seagulls generally bouncing back um, also, just keep a low-key eye on Kieran Foran, just how he performs in, in a big game, um, balancing the workload, because Foran's going to be on the left edge, Cherry Evans on the right edge. If Foran's just as involved as Cherry Evans, that means the manly left edge is just as involved as the manly right edge. And when you think about Schuster, Trebojevic, um, brothers, both of them, and all the weapons manly have, a balanced attack is going to be pretty dangerous for them. Panthers versus Eels is pretty simple for me here, Wildcard. Um, fascinating nonetheless. I do have some intrigue around Dylan Brown. I've uh, referred to him as backseat Brown for the Eels, just with what he's doing at the Eels. Once again, uh, Kiwi NRL perspective is about 
Um, just letting Dylan Brown do his role. Dylan Brown, the thing I noticed from that game is that Dylan Brown doesn't have a lot of try assists because he's the one passing to Clint Gutherson. Gutherson and Moses, in, in, of the regular season, they were top 10 in try assists. So Dylan Brown is passing to Gutherson, who is then getting the try assist out wider. And Moses has all the try assists on the right edge. So Dylan Brown just kind of does a more basic role within the Eels system. And I think that's fine. Like I do like his uh, run meters and kick meters were below average against the Knights. Um, so there's room for improvement for that. But with uh, backseat Brown, we're just looking for him to do his job in the Eels system. We're not looking for razzle dazzle because that's not the Eels system. The Eels system is you get the ball to Gutherson or Moses. That's all he's got to do and run the footy every so often to make sure that the um, he engages defenders to open up that space for Gutherson. So with Dylan Brown, look for how influential Clint Gutherson is. Because I have the feeling if Gutherson is uh, wreaking havoc down that left edge, a lot of that is coming from Brown. But the key thing here, Wildcard, did you watch that Eels versus Knights game? Uh, not all of it. Uh, it was the one game where I... Um, only caught it in in uh, splotches. It was like it was brutal. Like just some of the stuff that Eels Ford Pack does is absolutely ridiculous. Like there was a set there where Regan Campbell Gillard was just putting big shot on, big shot on, big shot on, like consecutively. And when you think, like again, keeping in our perspective, I everyone talks about Campbell Gillard, Junior Paulo, Nathan Brown, Isaiah Papali'i was statistically the best eels forward and Marata Niokori did a great job at right edge as well so you've got that eels forward pack that literally um, loves the brutality they love the physical contact they love um, and I think that's that was a great matchup against the Knights because the Knights is all about their forward pack less creativity in their back line and I think the Eels were just like, we are going to hammer your forward pack and make this a nightmare for you. They come up against James Fisher-Harris, who has had three below-par performances in a row. And unless James Fisher-Harris uh, steps up to that challenge, he is out of form at the moment. So it could go either way, bounce back or um, keep it along this track. Unless he comes out with another monstrous performance against the eels i'm thinking the eels could get a win here but the battle between james fisher harris and the whole eels ford pack is going to be fascinating yes of course it's an entire panthers ford pack but fisher harris specifically has had three games below um, his high standards and he's the one who needs to step up because he is the leader of that ford pack yeah, I felt like the, I mean, the the Panthers got Wayne Bennett last week, didn't they? Where um, they they just, similar areas to what we're talking about with the uh, Seagulls against the Storm. It was the same thing of like, just like limit what they do well, um, target the weaknesses. Even still, I felt like that was a game where just watching it, like I wasn't entirely, like it was an incredible effort from the um from the from the bunnies there but i i still kind of felt like Penrith left that one out there on the table there were a few like half breaks where they didn't capitalize or whatever um they they looked for a long like for long stretches it, it felt like they could cut through the rabbitos they just never quite did um so i i i'm i'm not sort of buying the old uh i don't know i i can see the reasons why what you're saying are like the, the eels get them in a similar kind of grind they're, they're a team who could do like the same thing that the rabbitos just did to penrith i just i don't i don't know i don't really think penrith have that in them two weeks in a row but um we shall see because it would be a bit of a it'd be a bit of a blowover if they did and it would probably require a fourth uh subpar james fisher harris game in a row for that to happen and in which case um, that's not the kind of energy you want to take into the off season, generally speaking. So uh, it could be, it could be a pretty, could be, I mean, I think both of these games are pretty fascinating. And I thought mo like the first week, all four games, um, 
were excellent like entertainment value um even like even the the storm blowing out the um the seagulls was you know fascinating in its own way because i was kind of expecting that to be one of the closer ones of the round and it wasn't um and then the game where i thought was going to be a blowout the roosters and titans ended up being one of the most entertaining and also hilarious games that i've watched of nrl in a long time because they were just the Roosters gifted them some tries, including like the, the there was that one where I can't remember who it was, but um someone like had the ball running off from basically their own goalpost, lost it, and it just like landed in the lap of a Titans player two meters in front of them and it walked over and scored. And I like I, I laughed out loud, like I cracked up at that. It was just the weirdest thing I've ever seen. Um and then that almost cost them their their um their finals chances. So uh, it's not really the kind of time where you want to you want those kind of things to be creeping in but um like really really entertaining games throughout it was just good to see because it was one of those like it was a it was a strange season where you had a lot of blowouts every time a top sort of 18 would come up against the bottom 18 there'd be 40 points in it and um it led to a lot of talk about the rule changes and and um you know the, you know it, the way that it kind of like favors the team and momentum so that what used to be like 12 point wins are becoming 24 30 point wins and um is the league becoming like is it no longer competitive enough and all this but then you actually see you get to finals you get to the time where everything matters and everything like clamps down and um you know even the eighth place team only just lost there with it by a drop a drop goal at the very end you know it was a it was they were even the matchups that didn't feel like it would be the case on paper were really entertaining. And I think this week is like the second week of finals is poised to follow on in that, um, in that same mold and in all the same kind of ways. So you're going double bounce back. You're going yeah, I am. bounce back yeah. and Panthers bounce back. Taking the top four teams to make the, the top four, which would mean, um, what did I say? Uh, or he said Manly would come up against the Rabbitohs. So that would mean that, Penrith slash Parramatta will play uh, the Storm in the in the um, what do they call them? Do they are we just going with semifinals or do they call them like preliminary finals or something or whatever? It's, We're going it, the semifinals, semifinals, effectively. Yeah, the only thing that I, that has me going a little bit more eels is I don't like the Rabbitohs don't have that like just pure. I think the Eels have more pure aggression in going after their opponent. And that was yeah. on that was on display against the Knights. And I think they might smell a bit of blood in the water with the Panthers. And I, I don't know if Wayne Bennett had a plan to limit Fisher Harris or if Fisher Harris is just off, but I think the Eels will be um they'll be making that battle through the middle kind of personal. That's what they do, and that's what they do pretty well. Um, and I think if 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 you're an Eels forward pack and you put a couple of big shots on against the Panthers, then you're testing the underbelly. Then you're testing, and then you're getting into For like sure. what do you what do you guys actually do when you're on the back foot? Because they win a lot of games on the front foot, and a lot of that is based upon Fisher Harris. So um, fascinating Kiwi NRL battle there, and uh, specifically Kiwi NRL, we're looking at Fisher Harris versus Papali'i through the middle. And that's like Papali is in fantastic form this season. Um, Nia Kore will get busy on the edge as well. No Makahisi Makatoa. He is on the bench, uh, extended bench. Ryan Madison comes in. So um, keeping a close eye on that. Also, rugby league housekeeping here. The Warriors have their reserve grade team and under 21s team with Redcliffe Dolphins playing finals footy on Saturday. So um, I'll also be tuned in with that. I would say like the players named, but that changes literally just before kickoff. So you kind of got to, if you're not watching the game, you've got to check the team list of who actually played rather than who was named. So um, we'll touch on that later. I'll um, put some information about that later on after the game and we'll uh, see what happens there. 